we warmly welcome you to the 14th Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Detol. This session is presented in partnership with Rajasthan Patrika. It's our pleasure to present now Fool Sunghi, The Scent of a Text, Gautam Chaube and Francesca Orsini in conversation with Jatinder Kumar Nayak with a reading by Manoj Bajpai. The first Bhojpuri novel to be translated into English, Fool Sunghi, is a period piece about the life of a Tawaif in the late 19th century in colonial Bihar. Dhila Bhai contends with the power of a Zamindar who wishes to trap her into a cage but she yearns for the voice and company of a wandering minstrel. Though Bhojpuri songs and cinema have gained in popular appeal, the richness of Bhojpuri literature is not widely known. Gautam Chaube, an academic and a columnist, has innovatively translated this modern classic and rendered it with cultural nuances and poetry. Academic and author Francesca Orsini's books include The Hindi Public Sphere 1920-1940, Language and Literature in the Age of Nationalism, and Tellings and Texts, Music, Literature and Performance in North India. In conversation with Jatinder Kumar Nayak, academic and award-winning translator of Uriya literature, Orsini and Chobe discussed the novel, the times it was set in, as well as the challenges of presenting it for contemporary readers. The session will include an evocative reading by celebrated actor Manoj Bajpai. Gautam Chobe teaches English at the University of Delhi. He is a translator, a bilingual columnist and a literary historian. He writes on Gandhi, education, popular culture and Indian literature. He is working on a history of Bhojpuri literature and a monograph tentatively titled Using Gandhi. Francesca Orsini is Professor of Hindi and South Asian Literature at SOAS, University of London and the author of The Hindi Public Sphere and Print and Pleasure. She's just finished a book on the multilingual literary history of Purab and is leading the ERC research project Multilingual Locals and Significant Geographies. Jatinder Kumar Nayak retired as Professor of English, Utkal University in 2016. He was a member of the Raja Ram Mohan Ray Library Foundation, Department of Culture, Government of India. At present, he is member English Advisory Board, Sahitya Academy and is Editor-in-Chief of Marg Asia. His English translation of classic Uriya novels have been published by University of California Press, Oxford University Press and Penguin Books. Recent publications include the co-edited South Asian Critical Discourse, which is in Uriya. Manoj Bajpai is an acting stalwart who is one of the finest exponents of method acting in the country. In an illustrious car career that has extended over 25 years, he's immortalized characters of all shades and movies belonging to diverse genres. Please do comment by typing it in the comment section. Ladies and gentlemen, Fool Sunghi, the scent of a text. Gautam Chobe and Francesca Orsini in conversation with Jatinder Kumar Nayak with a reading by Manoj Bajpai. I must say I am excited and it gives me immense pleasure to engage uh, my valued young friend Gautam Chobe and the very eminent scholar Professor Francesca Orsini in a conversation about this fascinating text. Uh, as you have already mentioned, this is the first ever translation into English of a Bhospuri novel. So this calls for celebration. I think this is a, an exciting moment for, for translators like me who do not uh, write or do not publish best-selling translations every day. So this is great news, very good news that this translated text has become a bestseller. And this is also uh, another important occasion for being introduced to a world about which we know very little. We know Hindi literature, we know Bangla literature, we know other South Indian literature, something about them. But Bhospuri world, the Bhospuri literary sphere was not very well known to us. We are not very familiar with it. Bhospuri films, yes, we know the iconic actors of Bhospuri films like uh, Rabi Kishan, Manoj Tiwari, and Bhospuri Songs are also extremely popular, but 
not many of us knew that bhojpuri speaking world has such a rich literature and this translation introduces this rich literary culture to us and deepens and broadens our understanding of regional literary traditions about his professor or sini will talk to us later so i'm very glad to be here today and it's an exciting opportunity to talk about something that needs to be explored something that needs to be uh, understood at much deeper level so um before i begin the conversation with our distinguished guests i will invite uh, the iconic uh, bollywood actor mr manoj bajpai to uh, read an excerpt from phulsungi uh, the novel that has been translated by gautam in namaskar aap sabko bahut bahut dhanyawad ki aapne mujhe इतने बड़े इतने पवित्र समारोह में मुझे आमंत्रण दिया है ताकि मैं कपिल पांडे जी द्वारा लिखित फुलसुम की उपन्यास का थोड़ा सा उसका वाचन करूं तो ये नवा अध्याय बा अपने लोगों के खातिर तनी सा पढ़ें ज़्यादा ना लेकिन बहुत बढ़िया बहुत मशहूर भोजपुरी के सिंगर क्रांतिकारी महेंद्र मिश्र के जीवन पर लिखल बाई तो नवा अध्याय अपने लोन खातिर बाबू हलिवंश है पकड़ी से लौटले तो धूरा से पूरा सना गई रह देह पर के रेशमी अंग रखा पसेना अधूरा से चिकट हो गई रहे चेहरा सुखला आँख लाल रहे आवते पलंग पर गिर गई ले बड़ी देर के बाद उठ लें पलटुआ गौसलखाना में पानी भर दिले रहे नहा धो के कुछ ताजा भई लें खानसामा खाना लगा चुकल रहे डाइनिंग रूम में जाके लौट ले पलटुआ आज हम खाली दही खाए रे पलटुआ मुंह ताकत खड़ा रहे दौड़ के दही ले आए बाबरची के बोलाहट भैल यूसुफ मियाँ बाबरची हाथ जोड़ के आके खड़ा हो गए यूसुफ मियाँ तू अब बूढ़ हो गई ल रिवेल साहब के हमार खिदमत करत तहार पूरा जिंदगी सिरा गई बाकी ना रिवेल साहब तारा खातिर कुछ कर सकल हैं ना हम ही कुछ कर सकनी थोड़की देर चुप रहले बाबू हलिवन सहाय यूसुफ मियाँ सकता में चुप सुन अब हम चाहत बानी जे तू अब आराम कर आ वो परवरदिगार की याद कर कुछ एकरो खातिर समय चाहिए नू तोहरा कोनो मन के साथ बाकी होके तो वो बोल दो हम ओकरा के पूरा करें बोलत बोलत छुपा गई ले बाबू हलिवन सहाय हलिवन सहाय ऊपर आँख क के हवा में कुछ देख ले रहे अभी काले तो परलोकवासी भैले हँ बाल मित्र गायनाचार पंडित राम नारायण मिश्र मिसिर भाई के कोनो साध कोनो इच्छा पूरा ना कर सकल बाबू हलिवन सहाय मिसिर भाई के इच्छा स्वार्थ के लेके ना रहे जवन भी इच्छा रहे वो हलिवन सहाय के सुख समृद्धि आइज्जत प्रतिष्ठा के लेके रहे बाकी अपना जवानी के एठ हा धन के घमन में मिसिर भाई के बूझ ना सकले रह हलिवन सहाय जी आ कटु वचन से दुखी होके घर से निकाल दल गिर आ बाद लंबा पंद्रह बरस के दू दे एक प्राण ऐसन रहे वाला दोनों दोस्त अलगा अलगा एगो ऐसन आँच में दहकत बितवल जौना के इर्खो ना कहल जा सके आ पश्चातापो ना कहल जा सके वो पंद्रह बरस बड़ा दुख में बितल रहे हलवन सहाय के आ पाँच बरस पहले जब गुलजारी बाई के उठवा मंगवा ले बाबू हलवन सहाय तो आपन कुल इर्खा धोके दौड़ल आई रहा है पंडित राम नारायण मिश्र एकांता में बोलल रहा है कि ये हलवंत ये दिनवा बचावे खातिर नू ये दिनवा बचावे खातिर नू हम तहरा के वो घड़ी बोलते रह ली आ तू झगड़ो कैले रह अब जे कैल से कैल अभियों से चेत जौना मेहरारू के घर में डाल ले लो कर इज्जत मत उधार बाबू हलवन सहाय हंस के बोले रहस ए मिसिर भाई 
ये हमारे बिया ही है का आ तब मिसर भाई ठठा के हंसल रहा ताका मुजफ्फरपुर के ढलवा रंडी हो अरे वो तो मर गए सराय में वही रात के ये तो बाबू हलवन सहाय के महरारू हो बिहई होखे चाहे रखनी आ वो दिन के बाद फिर गुलजारी बाई चिलमन के बाहर महफिल में ना बैठ ली बस ये दो पन्ने की आ, ये दो पन्ने को बाचा मैंने और मैं आशा करता हूँ कि आप लोगों को ये काफ़ी अच्छा लगा होगा और साथ साथ ये भी कहूँगा कि जो लोग भी पढ़ सकते हैं भोजपुरी में वो फुलसुंगी ज़रूर पढ़ें और गौतम चौबे जी ने इसका अंग्रेज़ी में भी अनुवाद किया है ट्रांसलेशन किया है उसको मंगा के ज़रूर पढ़िएगा क्योंकि मुझे लगता है कि महेंद्र मिश्र की जो ज़िंदगी है वो एक बहुत ही प्रेरणादायक है एक क्रांतिकारी एक सिंगर एक महान गायक भोजपुरी गायक जिनके गाने आज भी बहुत पॉपुलर हैं कई उनके जाने के कई साल बाद भी और क्रांति तो उनके जीवन का हिस्सा थी कहीं ना कहीं बहुत सारे क्रांतिकारियों से जुड़े हुए थे बिहार के इतिहास में उनका एक उनका नाम हमेशा ही बहुत ही गर्व के साथ लिया जाएगा तो या तो आप फुलसुंगी भोजपुरी पढ़ सकते हैं तो कपिल पांडे जी की लिखी हुई फुलसंगी पढ़ें या फिर अगर नहीं पढ़ सकते तो गौतम चौबे जी ने इसका अंग्रेजी में अनुवाद किया है वो जरूर पढ़िएगा धन्यवाद थैंक यू मिस्टर बाजपाई फॉर रीडिंग इन सच अटिंग वे वी ऑल फेल्ट एंड थ्रोल्ड बाई योर रीडिंग and it uh, in, i am sure it will increase in the enhance the appetite of readers uh, everywhere to go through this novel so let me begin by asking an obvious question to uh, the question that that appears to be obvious but i am sure gautam will give an exciting answer to very interesting answer to that uh, why did you translate this novel what is it that drew you thank you what professor that fascinated you about this text which is supposed to be known only to the bhojpuri uh, readership and not very well known and uh, also tell us something about the distinction between the bhojpuri literary sphere and the more dominant more well known hindi literary sphere so let us hear something about you something from you about your choice of this text this very interesting fascinating text but what led you to choose this text to translate thank you thank you professor naik for that wonderful question and thank you jlf for inviting me uh, also thank uh, manoj vajpay and uh, professor ursuni for joining us um yes that's the most obvious question and uh, 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 but but then you know it allows me to unpack and say so many things about text uh, about culture and about how people in the region interact with uh literary specimens which uh do not belong either to the hindi world or to the english world uh the bhojpuri literature i grew up with uh, quite a lot of bhojpuri literature because my own uh, grandfather was a bhojpuri writer of some repute and uh, like all bhojpuri uh, writers he wrote across genre he wrote uh, poems and and uh, uh, long narratives and narrative poems and uh, novels and short stories so my mother would read those stories out to me Uh, so i grew up with bhojpuri literary world and bhojpuri stories but it was in 2017 that i chanced upon this uh, novel uh, at the behest of a senior the senior who lived in the same apartment he introduced me to this book and said you know you you need to read this uh, and when i read it uh, i was moved in ways that uh, uh, i hadn't felt you know the emotions it invoked uh, i hadn't Ex- experience those emotions surge uh, uh, earlier maybe it was the charm of the language the language that i grew up with uh, and the story is fascinating you know it's a story about uh, full with full of courtesan culture and court cases and, and crime and decoity you know it has that cinematic uh, quality to it uh, and uh, the story brings together two of the greatest icons of the bhojpuri world uh, it it brings together uh mahinder mishra you know the enig- enigmatic folk poet of uh, bhojpuri uh, very popular in the region uh who spent quite an adventurous life uh he 
uh, was also jailed for some time uh, for counterfeiting currencies. Uh, his songs were extremely popular. He was also known to uh, move around in the revolutionary circles uh, in Chapra. And it also brings together Pandey Kapil, who happens to be the author. And Pandey Kapil is, uh, is perhaps the most important figure in, in modern Bhojpuri uh, because he brought together the entire Bhojpuri literati. Uh, he edited perhaps the most important Bhojpuri periodical. He founded uh, the most uh, influential and, and the most uh, constructive Bhojpuri association or association of Bhojpuri authors. And at a time when others switched to Hindi, uh, he is someone who, uh, uh, who wrote exclusively in Bhojpuri. He started his career as a Hindi poet, Pandey Kapil, but then he shifts to Bhojpuri and he stays there. So it brought together a fascinating story, uh, a, a regional legend. Uh, it brought together two characters central to Bhojpuri literature, one a historical, one a contemporary one. Although Pandey Kapil is no longer there, he passed away in 2017. The story was fascinating and the story to me it challenged some of the misconceptions about the Bhojpuri world you know about a world uh, that glorifies violence and you know uh, sexual misdemeanors uh, as is uh, unfortunately portrayed uh, in in some of the uh, Bhojpuri films or as is the perception misperception so it's a story about a tawaif you know who ends up becoming a matriarch you know it's, it's a story about a zamindar who like all zamindars uh, of the lore uh, is uh, is autocratic uh, uh, has a gang of decoits to assist him you know uh, who, who who do whatever he wants them to do but eventually becomes uh, a saint and he isn't just uh, the only character in the novel that changes there are all these wonderful characters you know who undergo transformation so this novel also in a sense celebrates possibility it it contests uh, the misconceptions about the Bhojpuri world, but it also celebrates a world of possibilities. Uh, and that to me was uh, something which I wanted the readers to know. Okay. So um, this is yeah. why I felt that, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Gautam, for giving us such a wonderfully succinct uh, summary of the novel, which I found extremely uh, interesting and exciting and uh, layered. It had a layered richness and uh, and I found it a quiet novel. I mean, like many of us would expect a lot of violence and uh, excitement from a Bhojpuri novel, but it's a quiet novel. It begins with a lot of violence, but as the action unfolds, as the narrative unfolds, we find a lot of forgiveness, reconciliation, a sense of harmony coming over the action. So, uh, Professor Arsini, uh, before I ask you any questions about uh, uh, some other aspects of the novel. Would you share with us your own personal response to this novel? You have written an endorsement to the novel and you must have enjoyed reading this novel, but what is it that drew you to this novel, to this narrative? What, what is your personal response to this text? Then we'll go into uh, other details. Thank you. And first of all, let me congratulate uh, Gautam for this uh, achievement. And uh, and I'm, I'm also delighted that... Um, such a novel um, found, uh, found so many readers. I think that's really, um, for me, a, a welcome sign. And I think what uh, attracted me to it, well, I've been curious. I mean, I'm not a Bhojpuri literature specialist by you know, any stretch of the imagination, but it seems to me that um, you know, in order to proper under properly understand Hindi and properly think of Hindi as a rich, um, as a lit rich literature, we need to think of it in, uh, in conjunction together with the bolis that are, you know, some often, at least in people's, in writers and readers and, uh, you know, just people's minds, always also there. So we have um, written literature, but then we have oral literature. And often oral literature is kind of uh, separated. No, it's thought about as sort of lok sahitya, something that has not nothing to do with literature or, you know, it's a separate, it's traditional and so on. So I was really um, intrigued by um, another novel, I would say, I mean, and yet, uh, I mean, the first in Bhojpuri that I have uh, read, but that sort of tried to bring that excitement, that liveliness, that uh, depth of history and emotions and uh, appeal 
of oral literature onto the page, so onto the written page. And uh, like uh, you, Jatina, was, I was struck by the characters. I was struck by how, um, how thoughtful they are, how, uh, how you know, they're not um, cardboard characters at all. They, they go through um, turmoil, they, uh, they doubt, they shift their position. So that was, um, and, and overall the, the kind of the, the material side, uh, the material side of, uh, um, well, well, how the material and the artistic side the mat and, or the performance side are, uh, are tied together is also shown, I think, with a lot of uh, sensitivity. Um, no, uh, I would like to ask Gautam about uh, a very important aspect of this novel, which almost every reader is bound to notice. That is uh, the way the world of music, the world of classical music, the world of folk music is explored in this novel. Immediately, one uh, the, the novel Umrao Jan comes to one's mind. And of course, uh, Eba Sadam, uh, Prem Chan comes to mind. There are very few novels which deal with the world of classical music, its rise and fall, the way classical music became more and more respectable within courts, and the whole world of the wives being marginalized. And I, uh, the, again, it, the story of Gahar Jan comes to our mind immediately, the way the world of classical music dominated by, uh, like you said, patrons, the wives, and uh, the maestros, that, that candid kind of interaction among them, slowly giving way to a more respectable, uh, a greater concern with respectability, which marginalizes the wives. So please talk to us about this world of classical music that you find in this novel and the way it shapes people's lives. There, and its decline, and the fate of the situation of the wives, uh, so poignant that uh, we have to think about novels of fiction dealing with the, uh, the the world of classical music in Indian novels. So Gautam, thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, I mean Chapra had a vibrant uh, culture. You know, Chapra. There was an entire locality in Chapra where the courtesans lived, and uh, now that locality has disappeared. Uh, it's being taken over by coaching institutions. Uh, the the Tawaifs being banished from uh, Chapra, the way they have been banished from uh, other cities as well. Uh, but uh, the courtesans are responsible for bringing in culture to this region. You know, in a sense that uh, when we think of the, the great performers of Bhojpuri, we think of Bikavi Thakur. You know, the great uh, folk uh, dramatist, and uh, his plays were shaped. Uh, deeply influenced by uh, the folk theater of uh, two artists who had come to the region uh, via Lucknow, but originally from uh, an Iranian family that uh, was attached to the Delhi Darbar. Uh, these were Sundari Bai and Dunya Bai. So, so these sisters, they, they brought the whole tradition of uh, folk theater to the uh, region. Uh, they, they were from an Iranian family, like I said, uh, with Delhi Darbar. Once the Darbar at Delhi disintegrated, they moved to Lucknow. From Lucknow, they moved to Muzaffarpur, and from Muzaffarpur, they came to Chapra, Shivan, and other places. Uh, so it's really tragic that uh, the wives who were responsible for introducing culture in the region, uh, who sustained culture, who contributed to the enrichment of Indian classical tradition, uh, they suddenly uh, uh, disappear, you know, or are being forced out, were being forced out, as Premchand is also uh, shown in his novel. Uh, Seva Southern forced out, forced out of the cities. Uh, but in Fulsunghi, uh, we see this wonderful interaction, you know, between the classical world and the world of the Tawaifs. Uh, uh, it celebrates the music that Tawaifs uh, represent. It celebrates the exploits of uh, Dela Bai and Vidya Dhari Bai. And uh, it uh, tells us that many of these were uh, great performers at par with perhaps the best in India. But then it also, at some level, uh, suggests ways to uh, purify uh, the Tawaif. You know, eventually she has to give up uh, on the erotic songs and uh, gradually move towards uh, the bhajan, you know, s singing devotional songs. So that trajectory which suggests a way to purify the Tawaif, uh, coupled with uh, other trajectories that 
forced the Tawaiyas out of the city. Uh, unfortunately, you know, led to the decline of this whole culture. But then this culture had its own merits, as we know. You know, a folk poet like Mahinder Mishra, uh, he could survive in this world without a regular employment. Mustakil Rozgar, uh, he could he could live wherever he wanted to, or he felt like. because he was supported by tawais wherever he, he went in fact when he was at the end uh, jailed uh, or apprehended for counterfeiting the tawais came to his rescue they mounted the whole defense they organized the defense and pulled in their resources so it's very unfortunate the way tawais have disappeared but then this novel celebrates uh, their contribution to the region their contribution to music and also uh, tells us uh, perhaps not so consciously the reason why they suddenly disappear or gradually disappear from uh, yeah. public spaces thank you um as i have already said the characters never cease to fascinate and surprise us they grow like professor porcini said they constantly surprise us they reveal unsuspected dimensions um in uh, usually a novel which is the product of literacy a world which is dominated by literacy people write the right the act of writing is placed above Uh, orality and oracha in many indian novels particularly in my own language for instance fakir mohan senapati's fiction you find these novels occupying a point of intersection between orality and literacy actually it's the narrator which is narrating the it's almost like a storyteller not someone who writes in a in solitude so this intersection between oracha and literacy uh, i'm sure as an authority on uh, this particular field Professor Orsini will illuminate this dimension of the novel. How orator enriches this novel. The speaking voice we constantly hear in this novel, songs, legends, rumors. How all these create a magical world. Uh, something that we ordinarily don't find in novels which are supposed to be read in solitude and which are written in solitude. So, yes. I mean, I think, as we know, songs have a very, you know, are very powerful. And I think this novel, for me, is about the power of songs. In fact, in a way, you know, you, I, I, I almost wish there were more. I almost yeah. wish there were more, more songs, more discussion of the songs, more, uh, uh, you know, you know, where the scenes where of singing, people are immediately transported and, uh, you know, in, into sort of some kind of ecstasy. But how that happens, you know, either through voice, through particular words, through the music, through, you know, what is it about uh, Mahinder Misra's song that is so, songs that is so, um, so striking and so transforming that it's kind of, uh, you know, left to the reader to imagine. And so I, I actually, I wish there had been For for a novel about to sing, uh, you know, a, a, a musician, there had been even more about that. But I think, you know, so this is a sort of um, old bugbear of mine, and I think uh, writers from Bihar have been more, you know, much more active in this than writers from UP. Say, you know, we have only just to think of Fanishwanath um, Renu and how much, you know, all kinds of oral um, forms of orality, uh, storytelling and songs and uh, theater really are shot through sounds, just the sounds of birds or sound. Uh, and, and in a way in Hindi, he's much admired, but he's considered, you know, an angelic, like a, you know, um, is that, it's kind of marginalized, yeah. uh, a regionalist and a sort of, whereas I think, um, I think much more can be done and should be done to bring, after all, the very rich world of, uh, of sound uh, that is still all around us, songs and so on, into, uh, into literature. I mean, I think what is interesting, and it seems, I, I, I wonder, in fact, if I may ask uh, Gautam what, what he thinks. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, one of the problems about um, including this whole world into literature has been the uh, moral, huh? kind of moral attitude. You know, the idea that, uh, A, first of all, that, you know, well, of course, then music means the wives, but means also, also all sorts of other yes. um, performer groups, you know, low caste performer groups or groups in which, you know, women are, you know, were not considered, are not considered respectable. I mean, Anna, Um, musicologist Anna Morkom has a book on uh, partly on the music scene in Bihar, yes. on the dance scene in Bihar, and yes. she calls it the illicit world of Indian dance. You know, so that 
actually we talk about decline, but you know, dancers and performers, you know, they're still there. It's not as if, uh, you know, there are tuition centers, but there are still dancers and people still go and they still train and so on. But the, the kind of the moral, uh, uh, how to say, um, the moral gaze uh, uh, is uh, always, it always seems to me stops uh, an understanding of how performance is a form of living. Performance is how arts are cultivated. Um, and it seems to me that the novel, I mean, as you say, you know, it's kind of, okay, the Tawaif become somebody who listens to bhajans or sing bhajans. So that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's also problematic. It's not as if it's it's problematic, okay. I would say. Yeah. So, uh, Gautam, would you respond to Francesca's question about yeah, this I mean, moral <laughs> gaze, which uh, <laughs> reduces, diminishes perhaps the Tawaif's world? Uh, yes, uh, the moral gaze, you know, it works in, in multiple ways. Of course, there are songs attributed to Tawaifs, and uh, they are uh, subject to the moral gaze, and perhaps that. Uh, accounts for, as uh, Professor Orsini suggested, fewer songs in, in uh, the book. But most of the songs in the book are in fact written by Mahinder Meshir himself. But Mahinder Meshir himself was subjected to another moral gaze, you know, because he was involved in the counterfeiting racket and he, was, he had uh, affairs with courtesans. He's, he doesn't enjoy that kind of a respect in, you know, uh, histories of Bhojpuri literature. He's almost a marginal character. And that is also the reason why Hikari Thakur, you know, much as we celebrate his work, he, he continues to have a very fossilized kind of an uh, existence, you know. Uh, uh, he is subjected to academic discussions. He's been subject of multiple PhDs, uh, several scholarly works, certainly politics. But as far as his songs are concerned and uh, his, uh, his plays are concerned, uh, they're not performed in places like Patna, you know, very, very, very rarely would a theater in Patna, you know, uh, supported by the Ministry of Culture, uh, would uh, stage a play by Bhik Bikhari Thakur, you know. Bhushpuri songs uh, uh, are, are in circulation, uh, but uh, these aren't, uh, in most cases, songs written by Mahinder Mishra or Bikhari Thakur, or for that matter, any Tabayev, who, like Dhela Bai, who is now no longer uh, recognized in the region. In the region. Uh, so the moral gauge works in various ways. You know, uh, Mahinder Meshir was subjected to one uh, criteria, his association with the Tawaifs uh, and uh, his association in the counterfeiting racket. Vikhari Thakur as somebody who uh, performed uh, or who mastered a, ki a kind of art which is equivalent of what is called in Bihar Londa Nach, you know, where men uh, dress like uh, women and perform. So for various reasons, you know, the, the, the gaze, uh, as you rightly pointed out, the moral gaze is there and it works in mysterious, inscrutable ways. But it's very, very dominant. Uh, in your novel, I mean, in the novel you translated uh, into English, you, in your introduction, you talk about the uh, larger world in which some of the characters move, the world of the Bihari immigrant. Okay, the characters not only stay confined to Chapra, it's limited world, a little world. They also go to Banaras and some of them go to Kolkata. So the world of the Bihari immigrant, it's a very short novel, hardly 160 pages, and covers a vast temporal canvas of 90 years, compresses so many things, but it also brings into the scope of the novel, action, uh, the experience of the Bihari immigrant. I think the experience of the Bihari immigrant in many ways enriches this novel. So would you like to reflect upon that and say something to us about it? The world of the Bihari immigrant yeah. as depicted in this novel. Kolkata yes. Certainly, the scenes that we see in, in uh, the scenes that we see in Calcutta, uh, it, I'm sure that that story must have resonated with many Biharis who may have read this work uh, originally in Hindi in, in Bhojpuri uh, when it was published. Uh, but the world of Bihari migrant, uh, you know, it's it's also an enabling world in that sense. You know, of course, you know, Mahinder Mishra wrote about. Uh, the, the tragedy of migration and how the wives who were left behind in the villages, you know, their agony, their anguish. But it's also in an enabling world. You know, you have uh, this Bulakna Dome uh, who goes to Calcutta and acquires a new identity and has a flourishing business. Uh, you have uh, the Munshiji's son who's also fled to Calcutta and, uh, and now owns... Someone uh, goes now, to Lahore, I think. Someone comes from Lahore or uh, Pakistan or... Uh, from, from Punjab. 
from Punjab. From Punjab, yes. yeah. So from from Punjab, yes. So they are also integrated in this world. So yes, this this the world of uh, Bihari migrants is is as we know. I mean, it continues to uh, to bring out stories uh, which are tragic, but it's also an enabling world. You know, to begin with, you know, uh, it creates possibilities. And what I also found very interesting was how caste barriers, you know, which are so strong, which are so pronounced in uh, the Bhojpuri world, somehow crumble uh, entirely in in a migrant situation. So, so Bulakna Dome has become Bulaki Lal Kayas, which is Kayast, and is now friends with a Brahmin. Uh, this perhaps uh, wouldn't have been possible had the two characters remained in Chapra. So it is uh, also, you know, uh, yes, there is a great deal of tragedy, tragedy of the migrant, tragedy of the families uh, that the migrants have left behind. But it is also an enabling world, and uh, it's a transformative world, and uh, it creates possibilities. So that's how I'd like yeah. to see it. Okay. Uh, I I would like to share uh, an observation with uh, about the novel with Professor Orsini. I wonder if she has. I'm sure she might have noticed it. But I think that the rivers play a very significant role in this novel. Even the last line of the uh, narrative is the crashing waves of Saraju. In the last scene, Saraju surges into the garden and uh, sweeps away the champak tree, and the full singing bird flies away. And then, of course, you have the Ganges. So there is something, in spite of the very limited world the narrative is projecting or depicting, the rivers, I think, are this dimension of movement, motion into this, that things change and things can be completely erased. And uh, the metaphor, the metaphor, the way the novel works at the level of symbols, like the Pulsungi, the cage. In fact, the, uh, the Penguin edition has a cage. Uh, on it. So, and you talk about many cases, many kinds of entrapment in the novel. The case of gender, the case of caste, the case of uh, well, <coughs> religion. At the same time, you have also, I think, uh, pointed out how a social alchemy works in the novel. A, a kind of tolerant uh, social vision manifests itself in the novel and is embodied in the very household of so just uh, talk briefly about that so that we... we... Well, to be honest, I, I, I support, thank you. I support uh, Gotham's idea of the world, of the, of the sense that we get in the novel of a world, of a very dynamic world. Huh? And I think the river for me is partly also, um, or, or the river is so strong and has this sort of also colonial undercurrent, hasn't it, of, yes. uh, of opium. Huh? After yes. all, Rivel Saab is there to establish, I mean, to run an opium uh, factory. And, and the idea that, you know, you have Banares, you know, Chapra is linked yes. or um, sort of to Banares. Uh, it's a link to West, the world. But also, also to, Cal to Calcutta. And, yes. and that is part of this colonial economy. Yes. And people are um, thriving in it, actually. Yes. Uh, they, they, ha they find possibilities. They can be in This is not really a political novel in that sense. It's yes. not, maybe, it you know, if it had been a novel about Mahinda Misa as a revolutionary or a nationalist, it would have been a different novel. But this is really about the, the kind of um, reversals and, uh, and adjustments, uh, as yes. Gautam says, that the colonial the world the is allowing. And, yes. and how, yes, you know, um, um, there are cages, but then people find their yeah. way out of to their cage and yeah. find their way somewhat out of the cage as well while being in the cage. I mean, it's, the, the horizons are very different from our horizons now, and they really make the best of what they, what, what life, uh, the cards that life deals to them. Whether you are, you know, the, the, little, the little young boy who comes back from Punjab with nothing and is taken in as a, you know, as a kind of foster son or Dela by herself or even Halivan Sahai himself who starts from nothing and thanks to, um, you know, help, the help and of course his own bright, uh, uh, you know, intellect. He, he, he shines. And again, if I may um, just add a little comparison, I was really struck that, you know, the second novel by Renu, Parti Parikata, also has a whole colonial, uh, yeah. opium colonial, colonial woman uh, sort of love story there. Uh, so it's interesting. I think uh, there's something about maybe the, the, yes. 
the stronger presence through opium and through the you know the farmers and so on in, in Bihar that has made it into literature as well. Okay, so uh, Gautam, um, this novel is described by the author himself as a regional novel. Sorry. Okay, and it begins before the 1857 mutiny and brings us up to 1930s to the freedom movement. So the canvas is, temporal canvas is really big. But what does it tell us today? I think, does it speak to us today? Does it speak to us a uh, millennial? I mean, how come it has become so popular? What is its elusive appeal that it talks about a time which is long gone and yet people find it so interesting, so fascinating. So would you, would you reflect upon that? Would you speculate on this possibility of something, writing about a re yeah. very regional world, a historical novel, talking about a very specific place, specific society with its customs, which are no longer perhaps as strong as they used to be, the world of music, which is no longer respectable and all long gone. What is, how does it speak to us today? Thank you. It's, it's a fascinating question, um, uh, which allows me to elaborate on the selling point of the novel. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, uh, people link this novel with a sense of nostalgia. But come to think of it, it starts in the 1840s and ends in 1931. I don't think uh, a great many people uh, uh, who, who have lived through that period are now reading it in English translation or even in Bhojpuri for that matter. Um, so there's a, this nostalgia of the period that you have lived through, uh, which is the real nostalgia, I, I, as, as I like to call it. And then there is this uh, aspirational nostalgia. You know, for a world you, you want to uh, go to, uh, you would have liked to live through a world where, uh, you know, perhaps the air is cleaner, you know, the, the water is purer, you know, the, the outdoors are greener. And life certainly is, is a lot simpler. Uh, and this is perhaps what this novel promises. You know, it, it begins with uh, violence. There's Dhella by abduction. And it ends on a note of reconciliation. You know, it, there are moments of treachery, but then there's this spirit of forgiveness that pervades the entire narrative. And that to me is perhaps the most uh, prized uh, essence that this, this novel provides us. You know, we, we're but living through times of great turmoil. We have right to go on and on. It was such a... Wonderful conversation, uh, but I think we should stop here. Thank you, Professor Orsini. Thank you, Gautam, for giving me this opportunity to share my delight with you. Thank you, Gautam Chobe, Francesca Orsini, and Jatinder Kumar Nayak for that stimulating conversation. We would like to thank our session partner, Rajasthan Patrika. We thank our celebration partner, Diageo. Thank you all for watching and being a great audience. Do stay connected and logged on to continue to watch the amazing sessions that are there in store for you. Please note that speaker books are available at the online festival bookstore by Amazon. Jaipur Literature Festival 2021 is protected by Debtall. <laughs>